All right. So uh, for the past couple of lectures, we've been talking about uh, transactions. We've been talking about different ways of uh, manipulating data and making sure that uh, the data that we're looking at stays consistent as we continue to manipulate it and as different entities try and manipulate the data at the same time. Transactions, and uh, we've talked about how uh, those transactions uh, how we can uh, ensure the correctness of those transactions. I kind of glossed over a little bit uh, this concept of deadlock, um, and based on some questions that the TAs have been getting, we can come back to it. Um, and once we talk about that, I'm going to move on to uh, some extensions of transactions idea of um, versioning and uh, keeping track of older provisions of data uh, so that you can go back to older versions of the data and so that you can uh, uh, recover from failures. Before I get into that though, uh, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, so first off, I'd like to get the event points absolutely, absolutely clear. Uh, the homeworks are not meant to be sort of the be all and end all. If you don't feel your uh, assignment, um, please just don't do it. Uh, you, you get to drop two homework assignments, I want to re-emphasize that, you get to drop two homework assignments, whatever your lowest grades are, just go away. And uh, even if you do submit fewer than five homework assignments, you're still getting uh, a relatively insignificant portion of your grade. Uh, from the homework. So uh, the, the homeworks are they're primarily for your benefit, not uh, for ours. I mean, we get some feedback, we do get a sense of what we're doing in the class, but uh, the main reason for the homework to be there and the main reason I'm trying to uh, encourage you to do it through grading is so that you can actually do it. Uh, that said, if anyone would like to, if, if anyone has uh, any comments they'd like to make, uh, to us about their assignment for submissions. Uh, now, I'm very serious about this, now would be the time to do it. All right, other announcements. Um, the, uh, I've mentioned this before, there is a uh, monthly uh, database seminar that's organized by some of the local startups. Um, if you're interested, the next one is going to take place on April 24th. Uh, the topic is distributed databases, so if you're interested, um, come on down, we'll have more details posted as the date gets closer. Um, I also would like to mention in that checkpoint too, uh, there are still a couple of groups that we're having trouble uh, submitting, and it's uh, mainly because the graders are kind of being a bit slow. Uh, we basically not extended the deadlines of keeping you an extra week, uh, kind of like the last. Uh, there is a one point penalty per day, so please uh, submit as soon as possible. Um, we're going to post checkpoint three later on in the week. Uh, the goal of checkpoint three is mainly going to be uh, that you get a little bit more time to pre process the data, to take a look at um, how the data is organized, and uh, use that time to do something like uh, build indexes. Uh, gather statistics and use those statistics and indexes uh, during the regular period of evaluation. We will also have a little bit more information about the statistic, uh, the, the uh, schema itself, so you can be doing things like marking off, um, marking off primary keys, unique values, and so forth. Uh, you get basically roughly a 10 minute, uh, 10 minutes of pre-processing uh, before you get to process the rest of the work. Uh, any questions, concerns on the projects? Yes. Is there a kind of due date for uh, We, the last day, uh, somewhere around the last day of classes, um, probably somewhere in the vicinity of the first week of the day. Similar, you basically have about a month as a All right, uh, any other questions? All right. So, like I said, uh, there's been 
a little bit of uncertainty about this uh, question of deadlocks, deadlock detection. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with deadlocks in the general? So I want to uh, cover this a little bit before moving on to, to the rest of the class. Uh, so what is a deadlock? Uh, just so that everyone's on the same page, uh, a deadlock occurs when two different transactions can't proceed because if one of them requires uh, a lock that the other holds, and the second requires a lock that the first one holds. So if there's any sort of any one of these cycles. Um, so there are basically two ways that you can address that situation. Uh, kind of like you have optimistic concurrency control and pessimistic concurrency control, you can have optimistic and pessimistic deadlock. Optimistic and pessimistic deadlock. Right? Anticipate that the deadlock is uh, is going to happen, and simply avoid getting into any situation that could potentially lead to a deadlock, or uh, detect that a deadlock occurred after. All right. Um, now, if we're anticipating, where where in the process might we want to? Uh, Anticipate that a deadlock is happening. Or uh, how would we uh, sort of how might we preemptively uh, decide preemptively avoid getting into that? Actually, let me back that up a little bit. Um, what could cause a deadlock? What are some situations where a deadlock could occur? Are in place is to keep uh, what's called a weight 
really simple. It's just uh, a graph where every single uh, node represents a transaction, and every single edge represents a uh, locked block. Um, so if uh, you have an edge on the transaction I the transaction K, that means that transaction I is waiting for transaction K. Now, 
you can get arbitrarily complicated with this and, and make your transaction model as detailed as possible. The, uh, the challenge here, or the, the difficulty, is that the more uh, If you want to be able to simply roll the transaction back, if you want to, uh, transaction one can't just give up the lot without having some logic behind it. Um, transaction one acquired that lot for some reason. It's expecting the value that it read out to stay consistent. In this case, it's a shared lot, so it's expecting that value not to change. Uh, which leads to uh, a very simple problem. You need to be able to communicate to transaction one that that is no longer the case. And in the simple transaction model that we're working with right now, those transactions are just black boxes. All you can do is uh, they can send reads to you, they can send writes to you, uh, and all you can do is either succeed or work. So, essentially what needs to happen in this case is that one of those three transactions needs to just get completely aborted. Really, the only way that you have of communicating to one of these transactions that occur is if you're hit by completely aborted. And well, there are more interesting ways of diving into it. Um, we may get to some of those later in the term. Uh, so uh, the the big the big problem here is the site weights for graph as a site again. And because of that, you need to take some kind of action. So, there are two ways of doing this. Um, anyone know off the top of their heads what, uh, how expensive it is to detect cycles in graph? Cycle detection is reachability, um, but it's reachability from every node to uh, itself. So in the worst case, you might have a cycle that traverses the entire graph. So computing, uh, doing cycle detection is horribly, horribly expensive. You have to do this, at, it's n squared in the total number of objects that are currently locked. Uh, in a typical database setting, this is going to be very, very large. Um, so you don't really want to do this on a regular basis. Um, so one uh, sort of attempt at doing something equivalent, uh, or at least that is, is guaranteed to be correct, even if it's not the most efficient thing possible, is to preemptively avoid getting into a, a situation where there might potentially be a dead So, how can you do that? Well, one way to do it is to ensure monotonicity over the uh, blocks that are being, the order in which you're acquiring the blocks. The other way to do it is to, the other way to do it is to detect when a transaction is, uh, is to disallow certain types of edges in the waste flow. When you bring up that graph uh, again. So, first off, which of these transactions are we going to go into? If we detect the cycle uh, in general, which would it make the most sense to kill? The 
let's assume that the orders, uh, the order of the transactions, that the transactions were submitted is the identifier. I heard that three. Okay. I can say the same thing. If I kill T2, I can still execute T3 if you want. Okay. okay, so if T3 was submitted last, then it might make sense to kill T3 because it's conceivably the youngest of the transactions. Uh, T1 and T2 have been executing for longer, so it might make sense to let them finish. Um, by the way, what would we do after we killed? Would we just completely throw the results away, or would we try to do something different? Okay, so uh, one, uh, one reaction to killing it might be to simply try it again. Now, what happens specifically, it, it depends on uh, whether or not you care about uh, it actually getting executed. You might want to defer to the user, for example. But, okay, uh, I'll get back to that. Um, okay, so you kill T3 because it's the oldest. Oh, sorry, it's the youngest. That'll free up this edge and allow, allow transaction one to complete. Oh, sorry, free up this edge and allow transaction two to complete, and then uh, it will allow uh, transaction one. Now, so we can avoid getting into this kind of situation in another um, rather than. Kind of in this case, the troublesome edge uh, is coming from T3 to T1. Because, T, uh, because T3 is depending on T1 to continue, uh, that's, you can consider that to be a problem. Uh, or uh, something that has the potential to lead you into a deadlock situation. So one trick that you can apply is rather than executing, um, rather than doing uh, cycle detection in general, you make sure that there's no cycles, that no cycles can ever be created by figuring out uh, what edges are getting created in this weight score graph. Just making sure that there's, uh, that certain kinds of edges can't be, can ever be created. There's two ways to do this. Uh, so the first possibility is that if a younger transaction depends on an older transaction completing, well, that younger transaction, uh, you end up, uh, you can only, uh, the first way to do it is to ensure that only older transactions can depend on younger transactions, but younger transactions can't depend on older transactions. This is known as, uh, uh, this, this is known as wait and die. So if, if a transaction would block on an earlier transaction, it just, uh, that transaction, that, that's an error. That transaction fails and has to re-execute uh, re Does everyone buy why that can't lead to dependency? Uh, 
where would the, uh, the threat of Guy says that I can acquire a lock on a thread with lower priority, but if the thread with higher priority, uh, if I try and acquire, acquire a lock that is already held by a thread with higher priority, then um, that lock acquisition would simply fail.
those transactions that are in the deadlock situation? Commit process is now more expensive. 
because you need to uh, essentially resolve all of these uh, changes. We have to apply them to the database. It's a quite costly process. Uh, and recapping, uh, this in optimistic concurrency control, there are typically three phases to a transaction. Uh, the read phase is the, uh, is the sort of bulk of the transaction. This is where it does all of its work. User-defined code happens. Uh, the validate phase is typically fairly fast, but not necessarily instantaneous. Uh, and this is where we detect whether a conflict has or uh, is about to occur by looking at the set of uh, values that the transaction has read from in the root phase and the set of uh, values that were objects that the transaction is about to write to. Uh, and then finally, the write phase, where you actually take these objects, these writes, and apply them to the actual database. Um, 
So we're making sure that there aren't uh, any uh, that transaction I doesn't write anything that uh, transaction uh, sorry transaction K doesn't I doesn't overwrite any of transaction K's values because there's no overlap between the Great. Um, now uh, we still might want something a little more elaborate. Under what conditions could we allow those two uh, trend, those two right faces to occur simultaneously?
have uh, 20 transactions in play, or better yet, n transactions in play. How many potential serializations of those n transactions? N, n factorial. So uh, we like to hear factorial. Yeah. Factorials are bad. You want to stay as far away from factorials as possible. So, just like with joins, we restrict ourselves to a certain uh, linear search space of uh, of with uh, <clears throat> with uh, serial schedules. We don't want to have to search through that entire uh, factorial space of uh, possible orderings. So we try and come up with a reasonable approximation and. Uh, if that means that we need to restart a transaction occasionally, then that's potentially okay. Um, any questions or concerns about that? So you should be a little concerned because uh, it's not always okay. Um, again, uh, In some cases, detecting that uh, an issue has occurred might be potentially more damaging, uh, might be more expensive, excuse me, than uh, simply restarting the failed transaction from scratch. So which, uh, which of those you do depends very much on the kind of setting of the room. So, okay. Um, One other thing to note, but just one other thing to note is that set intersection in general is also a very expensive operation. Uh, we're trying to compute the intersection of two sets. Uh, what is, how expensive is that going to be? In squared, if the sets are unordered, um, if you have an inventory ordered. Linear time, but it's still really, really expensive operation, and not something that we do very much. Okay. Um, right. So, a couple of, of additional notes. Um, with optimistic recursion control, you're recording literally everything that happens during the transaction. Every single write, every single Every single row that gets modified, every single row that gets read out, needs to be recorded uh, in the uh, alongside the transaction. And that's that's already a pretty huge order. Um, even just allocating the space for a set would be pretty expensive. Um, if you're considering this process, um, and testing for for conflicts the fact can be also fairly expensive. And if nothing else, you're not testing for conflicts until the very end of the transaction. You're not, uh, until the validation phase, you don't know whether a transaction is going to abort or fail. Because you're potentially doing work that uh, is, is unnecessary. So, what can we do about it? Well, one thing that was uh, brought up uh, last Wednesday was this idea of using timestamps. So another uh, strategy that you can apply is to mark each, uh, each object in the database with a read timestamp and a write timestamp. Every time you modify that object, you update the write timestamp. You read that object, you modify the read timestamp. And this kind of tracks all the operations for you. Okay, how would we take advantage of this information? So let's say I have a transaction with, uh, let's say I have a transaction as timestamp TI uh, and it tries to do a uh, read on an object A. What do I need to, moreover, we have 
A has a read timestamp, and it has a write timestamp. So what kind of checks do I need to perform? Okay, uh, what do we need to test to say that this read can successfully go on? Make sure that this right timestamp is less than I. Okay, now transaction I comes along and says I would like to write to D. Once again, I have a read timestamp. I have a right. Actually, let me back up a little bit. What happens if uh, which, what do I need to do if uh, this condition isn't set? The right timestamp is not less than the other. What can I do? This write has already been performed. Care about the read timestamp. Okay. Anyone say yes? Why might I care about the read timestamp? Let me actually example. Uh, so let's make TI timestamp of N. What happens if this? as a timestamp of 11. Right is greater than 
uh, ti, then I can simply uh, ignore the right. I don't know why I'm writing that on there, because uh, slides. Uh, so, right, if I try and read, then uh, I need to make sure that I'm reading from uh, conceptually uh, earlier transaction. And if I am, uh, sorry, if I'm reading from a later transaction, or I would read from a later transaction, I can't perform that read. Fit. Um, if I'm uh, if I'm then, uh, otherwise I can perform the read, and all I need to do is update the timestamp. Uh, if I try and write, uh, well, I need to make sure that I don't cause a dirty read, uh, and I need to make sure that the, uh, I'm not overwriting a value from later operation. I, was, I would be overwriting it. So this does lead to uh, a little bit of a problem. Uh, does anyone this does lead to a little bit of a problem? Here's a little bit of a, a scenario. Uh, I have two transactions, one of them performs a write, the other one reads the value, uh, then writes uh, a different value and then commits. Does anyone see the problem? Rudely overwritten the 
data that I was trying to read. Um, what can we do about it? I'll reverse the transaction. Okay, so we could potentially go back in time. You're, you're, you're onto something there. Uh, what do we need to keep track of? Versions, yes. So what we could potentially do is the information from the database's perspective, all of the information that we need is still there. Um, the, the transaction has provided us with all of the information that we need to properly satisfy this read. The only problem is that we may have decided to throw it away, throw uh, that previous information away. Um, so a uh, simple approach, let's not throw it away. Uh, let's keep track of every single uh, version, uh, every single version of that object that has ever existed. Um, so what happens uh, in, the, uh, in a typical database system is that there's a version every time uh, you release an object. You uh, create a copy or you basically store uh, a record of what the old version of that object was. Uh, and when you go back uh, and try and read that object, you still have it. Um, now, what kind of problems might arise in this case? How many objects do uh, we Greater than 21. 
So as soon as a transaction comes, so this object will satisfy any transaction uh, after transaction 20 or until the next break. So which tra uh, what's the um, what's the last transaction that this wouldn't satisfy? Twenty, or more generally, less than twenty-one. So if uh, so, basically, I need to keep earlier versions around as long as there are still transactions in flight with a lower time stamp. So whatever. Uh, Whatever, once I hit transaction 22, sorry, once every transaction with a timestamp lower than 21 finishes, there's no longer any possibility that this condition might be violated. And as a consequence, we can throw away or at least um, remove from main memory or, or archive all of the other versions. And this kind of will get us into uh, logging, which will start. Okay, so, so this, this idea of keeping around multiple versions can be generalized a little bit. And uh, this will get us into uh, just a, kind of what your appetite for it. Um, for what we'll be talking about on Wednesday, uh, this idea that we want to keep track not just of the, the data that's currently in the database, we want to keep track of how the data is changing over time. And this, this allows us to support a number of different uh, problems, or uh, to address a number of different problems. Um, the first and foremost is, as we're undoing the effects of a transaction, uh, whether it's during the write phase, uh, whether it's uh, while the transaction is Proceeding, we need to have some record of what effects that transaction has had. But we don't necessarily want those uh, that record to be prohibitively expensive to maintain. So what we can do is record each operation that uh, the transaction performs so that we can efficiently undo those actions. There's also a possibility that a transaction might fail. Um, the, uh, so we're nearing its right phase, the transact the uh, backfill closed through the power line, um, cats break into your data warehouse, whatever. Um, something goes wrong and your uh, your transaction isn't able to really complete. In order to kind of recover from this, you want to be able to keep track of what the transaction would have done. Finally, uh, logging also uh, kind of ties into uh, replication and uh, distribution. And we'll get into that a little bit as well. Um, so, with that said, are there any final questions? All right. Uh, see everyone.